Welcome to Sidewalk Talk. I'm Steve Fortunato. Fake news, what is it? And is that term a fair representation of journalism today? I discuss that and the state of journalism with a local broadcast news director on this episode of Sidewalk Talk. I'm joined by Tim Wenger, Operations Manager, Director of Content, Digital Strategy, and everything else there is at uh, News Radio 930 WBEN. We got uh, Sports Radio, WGR 550, and ESPN 1520 WWKB. Tim is an Orchard Park native, a local success story, big man on campus over to Intercom Radio, and has a lot on his plate right now. Thanks, Tim, for joining us. I've never been called a big man on campus over here, but I appreciate that. Ah, well, uh, essential, right? You are essential. You're there every day. That I guess I've discovered. There have been a few times over the past month where I've said to myself and others around me, I, I would like to be a non-essential worker for perhaps like the government with a contract and just, you know, like be at home in Zubas. I understand. Um, listen, tell me, how, how are you doing? How are you guys doing over there? You, what, what's going on and uh, how, how are you handling things? Um, you know, on a personal uh, note, I guess I would say I'm overwhelmed um, and uh, just overwhelmed with the amount of information and work there is to do during this. Um, it's nonstop. It's, it's pretty much 24-7. Um, I won't say 365 because, God, I hope we, we're not in this for a year, but um, it's definitely a 24-7 thing. I mean, the minute you stop or finish a task um, of covering something or, you know, kind of going through the information process, something else is waiting. Um, as I speak right now, there are three virtual news briefings I know being taken into our newsroom, um, two of them involving, you know, two of the largest uh, medical conglomerates locally, Kaleida and uh, uh, Roswell Park. Uh, simultaneously, the Erie County Legislature is meeting, um, and that's also coming in, so there's four. And then we also have a reporter out covering something in person where the mayor is right now. Um, so it's just, it's a nonstop flow of information. And what I find myself doing is trying to be the guy in this building that is deciding, you know, what's most important at any given moment. Um, I won't even say, you know, hour, but at any given moment, what is the most interesting and important thing that we can get out to the public, uh, whether it's on the radio or on any of our, uh, you know, the website, social media accounts. Um, so just overwhelmed with the, uh, the, uh, amount of information that there is to pass out. Well, you have multiple uh, responsibilities there. As the operations manager, you oversee, well, everything, right? And, but you're also the news director. So, so are, are, how are you able to, I mean, that, that's a lot of responsibility. And then at a time like this where, you know, we've never been through this before. It's not like you can go knock on on someone's door and say, "How did you do this the last pandemic?" Yeah, you know, we work as you well know. Intercom um, has radio stations all across the country, and some of the largest, the largest news radio stations, all news radio stations, are in the company. Uh, the WCBS is uh, WWJ in Detroit, the WBBM in Chicago, um, to, to list a few. And I look at them with a little bit of jealousy because they're sole responsibility is to produce news and offer um, you know a continual feed of factual information on all of their different assets on the air and online um, and that's a big task i'm not belittling the task at all but it, you can laser like focus that um, at stations like wbb uh, ben rather um, yeah wwl in new orleans um, kdka in pittsburgh where we're charged with being a news voice for a community as well as a talk radio side, it really presents challenges. Um, one, to maintain you know, a continual flow of credible and factual information at all times, um, because the news is more than the top and bottom of the hour right now. It's when, when it happens, we need to get it out. Um, yet there's also a need and a necessity, I think, for the community to be able to respond, react, and get perspective from our hosts, uh, whether it's Sandy Beach, David Bellavia, Tom Bowerly. Um, and those can come with opinions and to try to navigate that highway of what's news, what's factual, and what is conversation uh, can be dicey at times. Um, and that, that's probably my biggest challenge in that umbrella role that you're talking about beyond the news director. 
Yeah, it's tough because um, a lot of people now, when, when they, they think, I mean, your, your talk show host, which is entertainment and opinion, you know, they all lean to the right. Yet, as a journalist, as a news product, as your, your job is to be right in the middle. And I think people get that confused, right? They do. And it's, um, you know, and we remind them when it's appropriate. Um, you know, I can't get mad at a listener for not understanding, you know, when Sandy Beach says something, it's different from when Susan Rose says something or Brian Nazarowski. Um, but I can try to explain that to them. But I think what we're really trying to do is there certainly are opinions on the station. Um, number one, it's all local. We took our syndicated content off the air. Uh, to be local for everybody. We can talk more about that if you like. But um, so I do have control over that, that, uh, the, you know, the type of conversation. And my guidance to all of the hosts, and I'm talking non-news, but all of the hosts right now, is to be in info mode. Um, you know, a great example is Tom Bowerly in the afternoon. Um, he has opinions, he has perspective. However, the, the first thing that comes on that show all the time is what is the information that we need to get out. Um, presenting information is what they need to do first and foremost. And when it's appropriate to offer perspective, their perspective or community perspective, um, we will do that. And I think it helps. I think it does help people get some perspective. There are a lot of opinions right now as to whether, um, you know, I, I don't think many people question um, the obviously reality we're living, but there are some people that question how we're navigating it. Um, and to hear those varying opinions, I think, is a helpful community dialogue um, at the appropriate time. Uh, that's, that's the biggest challenge. How are you deciding uh, when and or when not to, or I don't know what, the, maybe you already are, I'm not sure. There are a lot of news conferences. There's the, the county executive daily news conference there's the governor daily news conference there's the president's daily news conference a lot of news conferences what are you doing about that how are you covering those it's really again good to go back to your comment about you know there's no playbook for this um there's no playbook for this um you know we started very quickly as did most media organizations of carrying these briefings and um the main briefings are the governor's briefing in the late morning uh, the county executive's briefing, which have now been scaled back, I think, wisely and smartly so to three days a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, around 2.30. And then the president and the White House task force have been doing theirs in the 5.30 to 6 o'clock range. We started airing them all. The, the double-edged sword to that is, once you start airing them, you know, when is the right time to stop airing them? We haven't come to that point yet. Um, and I'm not saying that's the right decision yet or, or wrong decision, but it's the kind of thing like, you know, once you start airing them, if you're not going to air them, it's, it, that is a, you know, decisive decision that you're going to tell the audience you're no longer going to get those here. Um, we're not ready to say that because each and every day something is getting announced of, of importance and some days it's more important than others. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, politicization of, of what's going on, I think, in, in all three of those briefings that is, un, you know, probably unnecessary to the, to the local public and American public. However, interwoven within it are some really important things. You know, what's being reopened, when it might be reopened, um, what's banned, what's closed, um, important stuff. And when you are kind of living in this environment where we realize most people are at home, um, they're they have more time to spend with media. Um, we think long form, the long form approach of offering, you know, these in-depth press conferences is, uh, is a good idea. I was kind of hoping they would start to scale them back somewhat on their own. And we saw that with the county, as I noted, uh, but the other ones still seem to be going, actually getting longer at times. Um, so I, it's a daily call, uh, but so far the call is we're airing them all, which we are today. It'll be a gut decision then? Uh, it will because there again there's no there's no research we're not a metered market um, so I can't say you know when the governor's on when Mark Bowman cars is on or, or the president is on you know numbers spike I can tell you that um, uh, one day when we needed to take something off because of a, another local story that was occurring um, we got feedback instantaneously from listeners like put that back on why did you take that off um, so we know they're out there we know people are listening and 
Um, part of it is my journalism hat. Um, I think providing information. Um, you know, here's what would happen if we, if we say today at 11:30 decided not to run Governor Cuomo, um, and we'll, you know, capsulize it the best we can. Um, you can't. I mean, how do you take an hour and you know present that, you know, to the listener factually? I mean, I think you really need to give them the opportunity to hear him. Um, you know, those that don't want to hear it, obviously, they don't need to listen, and they can, uh, you know, come back when it's over and, and hear the perspective that's being offered or the the, the wrap up or the follow up. But the minute we don't do it, I think we we kind of miss that position of being. Um, the place to be, at least from an audio standpoint, of where to get the most up to the minute um, factual information. It's going to come from those three guys, right? I mean, really, anything that's decided is going to come from those three press briefings um, at any given day. You know, as a, as, a, as a person who obviously has a passion for journalism, you're a news director, you oversee everything. So you are a journalist. When you hear the words fake news, how does that make you feel? Um, you know, fake news is like, how do you define it? I mean, the president is the one that came up with that, you know, during the campaign. Um, so I think we all have a vision of what is fake news. Um, it, it came up in his press briefing. I think his press, uh, the president's press briefings are, are highly contentious and they don't need to be. Um, I wish they were more just, here's the information and, you know, ask reasonable questions and get a reasonable answer. Um, I think they've gone to a place that they don't need to go. And I'm not going to even assign blame to that because there's probably some blame on the audience side in, in the press briefing room and, and certainly on the side of the podium as well. Um, but fake news, you know, to me, has sent, um, I think, an unfair characterization to the public that there are people in newsrooms like ours or the New York Times um, making up news, making up stories. Um, or making stories the way they want them to be. And I just don't think that that is the, the widespread practice that's happening in newsrooms, whether it's ours, whether it's Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 7, the Buffalo News. Um, I don't think there are that many vindictive journalists that are sitting around looking at a way to make up a story um, and change the facts. Um, I do, I'm not, I'm not ignorant to the fact that I think there are reporters that definitely show their bias from time to time. And I think that's another definition of fake news that's dangerous, and I don't like to see that. Um, and there are organizations, I think, that will, will, uh, will go after stories that are negative to someone that they're trying to put in that light. I think that exists. That's another definition of fake news. But the blanket, you know, it's almost a, it's a social media hashtag, right? You know, like if, if someone texts you, um, you know, I think this just happened, your response might be, Hashtag fake news. It's just become this thing. And I think that has hurt um, the journalism industry. No doubt. I, I, you, you, when I think about it, so now at the bottom of the totem pole, uh, in a lot of people's minds might be, and it's, it's not good, would be used car salesmen, politicians, and, and journalists. And it's all, it's, that's in the last three years. Journalists have gone from here down to here. Uh, although my dad, when I was growing up, was 60 minutes, he called them all communists, right? But um, so what, what do you think is the state of journalism right now? Disarray. I really think it is. Uh, it's in a state of disarray. Um, and I, I think that, you know, you mentioned 60 Minutes, and I'll tell you one of my pet peeves right now is um, on these uh, all, all news, quote unquote, news channels um, uh, at, at night during the you know, prime time, CNN, Fox News, um, where, you know, there's really not a lot of news going on after seven o'clock at night on CNN or on Fox. It's all opinion. And it's being... It, it, the, the problem I have with it, and I think this exacerbates the whole situation with, with the fake news and the, the reputation that journalism, uh, journalists have, is when you have a guy like Anderson Cooper who will be featured on that program that your father held in such high regard, and I think a lot of us do um, from time to time, yet he will open up every night's broadcast trying to find a way to hammer the White House. And you know, you just go down the dial to the Fox News side and they'll do the opposite. Um, I think that's dangerous, and I think that 
that that has probably been what has put this industry in, in the biggest state of disarray. Um, between the cable news outlets and the, the opinion versus news that they're presenting, um, and then the president dishing it all right back and attacking news organizations, I think has just raised the eye of the American and said, geez, you know, what is real? What is real anymore? Um, and I think everybody has their own answer to that question. And, uh, you know, my job on a daily basis is to make sure that when you listen to news and information on WBEN, that it's credible, it's ac as accurate as is feasible and as accurate as can be and presented in that way. Um, and it's going to be presented alongside, you know, some of the talk show hosts that, that will take that information and offer their opinion and, and perspective. Or so I understand the, the president felt that uh, that he was treated treated unfairly in many situations. I think the one mistake he we all make a lot of mistakes, but the one mistake he has made, I feel like he forgets that some of these people that they're human, you know. And so when you broad stroke everything and you go after people like that, they they may not react the way you want to. I think he, I, I don't think he anticipated uh, the, the fight back, that, the, the kickback that he has received over the last three and a half years. Yeah, a lot of the attacks that, that come from, from his podium are in, in uh, last night, um, you know, as of this recording last night, um, he opened, you know, here we have this, you know, I mentioned you, know, the three briefings a day, you've got, you know, our state, our county, and then the, the federal White House briefing. That briefing is a chance for the White House to get out its messaging. And it opened yesterday and turned into about a 20 minute tirade against one organization and their story about something that the CDC, uh, that the director of the CDC said. And I was so, I was actually in my car and I was just baffled. I'm like, I just want some information. Um, and I think, um, I, I always tell, talk show hosts, uh, both on BEN and on GR, um, that criticism is fine. Fair criticism of the action that you're responsible for is fine. If you don't like the way the coach is coaching, if you don't like the way the player is playing, if you don't like the way the mayor is administering, it's okay to say, hey, I think the mayor, you know, screwed this up. Or I think the coaching decision on this play or this series or this game was not good. But when you start calling the mayor names, when you start calling the, the coach a name or attacking his intelligence, um, that's where I think you get off the rails. And it, it, it puts us all in this, this big pile of, you know, you're a fake journalist, you're, uh, you know, you're just, you're just in that pile of uh, incredulous, um, you know, group, group of people we know as either talk show hosts or journalists, um, which I think is just so wrong and unfair um, but it's where we're at and it's something i try to guard against on a daily basis criticize actions don't criticize people right and, you, uh, and, and but you and you mentioned anderson anderson cooper and i just remember something specific that he's uh, something he said recently and it's it's to me that you you gave great classifications of what different fake news is and this is an example of fake news. I don't have the quote. I just heard it's when they, when someone makes an assumption, he, he was of course talking about the president and he said, president Trump did this and said this to cover up for this as though that's fact. And that's news. That, right. that is his opinion. And, and, and what happens is when you say it that way and you're like an Anders Cooper, and I consume that, I would consume that as fact because you're not going to tell me misinf that's misinformation. That's how could he say that's true? The president didn't say I did this because I wanted to cover up this. You are making, you are speaking. And so there is where that it's everything is, is gray area of what's, what is real and what's, what's not real. Is Anderson Cooper supposed to be news? I feel like it, like for you and, uh, you know, there's it, it, for me, it's pretty apparent when you have a, a news talk show host, host versus, you know, whether it's Tom Puckett doing the news or it's, it's, it's the morning news. 
you know, Tom Bowerly is, is, is not a considered to be a journalist. He is giving his opinion. It's entertainment. And there's, and I realize he's also giving a lot of information now and you're directing sure. him on that. But do you know what I mean? I, I think that, so I understand why people don't know the difference. I mean, I was in your business for, for years on both sides and I still can't, why would Anderson Cooper or some, why would they do something like that? Right. That well, you, is what drives people nuts. Yeah. I don't want to pick on Anderson Cooper cause he's just one of many, but um, he's someone that I, I do, I hold him in a, a regard of, of credibility. I mean, he's, he's had a, a very strong, you know, and, and terrific career. Um, yet when you look him up, if you, if you go to the CNN website and you look him up, he's a CNN news correspondent. I mean, that's what he is. Yeah, um, that's... So when you, so that to me right there, it would be like me putting up a thing that says, you know, um, you know, Sandy Beach, WBEN news anchor. It's just, I would never do that. Um, I think they've, I think those two networks have caused a lot of grief for a whole bunch of people outside of those networks, you know, people like myself. Um, and I'm, I'm equal opportunity in this. I think Fox does the same thing. Um, I get criticized all the time for trying to walk down the middle on social media, but I mean, the same thing happens on that network. Um, those, you know, and there are others too, you know, there's OAN and there's um, MSNBC, there's a whole bunch of them, but Fox and CNN seem to be the two dominant, obviously, probably, you know, due to ratings. But um, I think the actions that they've taken in their presentation of news slash commentary have gravely affected the perception the public has of all, at least electronic journalism, for sure. So there's a 17 year old kid out there and says, you know, I would like to get into journalism um, or maybe they, you don't study to be a talk show host. Uh, people think you do. You don't study to become the next voice of the Buffalo Bills. You know, there's not many of those jobs around. What advice do you have to somebody that's interested in journalism, broadcast journalism? So, I mean, a lot of people would expect me, you know, if they're around me a lot to say, don't. Um, but that's really not the case at all. I, I've learned as a father to to um, to not discourage what someone's aspirations, you know, are or might be. Um, if someone wants to become a journalist, um, electronic, print, whatever they want to do, um, I would encourage that. Um, I would just take a different route than I think a lot of us did, you know, back in the day. Um, where I, I'm not, I think journalism school is probably still a good foundation, but the best people in the electronic, um, whether it's TV, radio, audio, online, um, are people that are not just journalists or have been trained as journalists, are people that are great observers of life. Um, people that understand a whole bunch, a little bit about a lot, um, you know, and not an expert in any one thing. Having journalism as a base is not a bad thing. I don't even consider it to be a requirement anymore, but I guess having it as a base is not a bad thing. So maybe if you're interested, I would you know, go to a school that offers that, but I would, I would go to a school that offers that and a whole bunch more. Um, I studied, you know, a long time ago, I studied meteorology and discovered a passion I had for communications and kind of put the two together. Um, and my understanding of weather, you know, makes me probably a better person to do a lot of the stuff we do here with weather coverage. Um, you know, so I think I would encourage people to be well-rounded. Um, I also, I'm talking about school. I think, you know, I'd like to see someone that has had the discipline of going to some um, higher education and getting a degree. We tend to hire those types of people, but people that graduate, they can go to school for four years and if you have no practical experience in um, online editing, publishing, you know, some of the stuff you're doing right here, right now, um, or in a, a radio newsroom, a TV newsroom, or an online uh, newspaper, um, you know, it's kind of useless. I mean, I look at, I probably the only people I don't end up talking to when they apply for jobs are people that have had no practical experience whatsoever, because it says two things that you didn't have the interest in doing that or felt, felt it was important. And number two, you just don't have that practical experience. And I don't have the, the time and the wherewithal to get you at least to the base level where I'd like you to be to start. So um, school, yes. Uh, journalism, not necessarily. 
um, but be actively involved in um, trying to become well-rounded and getting some you know boots on the ground experience in uh, uh, whatever the area is that you might be interested in. Yeah, I have, you mentioned something. I have not thought about the advantage. You know, when you and I were growing up, you know, I'm Rick Jennerette, Ted Darling. There, there, anything they I stu- I never had an opportunity. We didn't have this technology, so I just I never thought. I thought, well, I got to find a school where I could I could do what they do. And so you go to school, and if you really, it wasn't about going to classes. It was about getting an opportunity to be on the radio station or write for the newspaper or be on the, on the TV station, which we had at the school that, uh, that I went to, or get an internship like over at Channel 7 or whatever it takes. But now, if you're really into it and you don't have access to things at school, whatever, you just you start your own, do whatever you want. Or you create your own tapes, your own demo tape. You can, Go interview people. You can the editing that you can do on the computers now. You can do it all yourself. Right. You know, I remember working. You know, for a long time ago, I for many years worked with Brian Meyer, who um, went on. He worked for the Buffalo News. Um, he still does, I think, in, in a capacity. He's writing their newsletter in the morning. But Brian always would tell a story. He teaches journalism, by the way, at Buffalo State. He would always tell the story about when he was a teenager. He started up a, a newspaper, and he would you know, print the newspaper and he'd walk through his neighborhood. It was for his neighborhood. And he would just walk around and hand this sheet of paper or shove it in your door. You don't have to, as you pointed out, you don't need to do that. You don't need to print a newspaper anymore and go walk around. You can establish your own website. And, um, you know, I look at that. I look at that. Those types of um, initiatives, I think, are really cool. And I see it in, in some young people. We had, a, um, you know, take this a step further. We had an intern from Canisius College this semester. And when this happened about a third of the way into the internship and his advisor reached out to me and said, are we gonna have to cancel the internship? You know, you can't have a student coming on premise, you know, because of the safety concerns and everything else. And I thought about that. I'm like, well, no, I mean, I think this guy now has the opportunity to do so much more than what he would have been able to do. He's been going out and, um, not going out, but he's been online covering virtual press conferences for us, submitting material um, that's being reviewed, um, but then posted to our website. He's editing audio, he's writing features. Um, What great opportunity for a young journalist to now hang that shingle out and say, you know, during that uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, not only was I an intern, but I kind of turned into a correspondent and, and, and was producing pieces for you know a major media outlet in uh, in buffalo new york that that kind of initiative and opportunity i think is what will make him a standout candidate versus someone who goes to school for four years and you know might get a 4-0 um, but never leaves the classroom ah great advice. We're talking with tim wanger operations manager news director wbea news radio 930 also wgr sports radio 550 and WWKB ESPN 1520 in the old days was WKBW, Danny Nevereth, all those guys. Um, listen, I'll, I'll let you go here, here soon. I do want to, you mentioned that that intern who took advantage of a fantastic opportunity and good for, for him. Um, do you see intern aside is your industry uh, changing? Are we going to cover more, news conferences or, or actions virtually rather than just going there? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's an important point to bring up. Um, I think two things are going to happen. Uh, yes, we are going to cover them more. Um, as I mentioned, you know, when we started talking, there were like four things going on right now um, at the same time, which would normally take four people and, you know, running around and, you know, with audio and everything else. Um, you know, we're discovering that, that we can now um, cover so much more um, when those opportunities are made available. Government meetings, for example, I think are all going to be um, available online. It doesn't mean you won't be able to go to the Amherst Town Board meeting, but it will be available live, uh, you know, on, on some sort of site where now everybody in Amherst or everybody anywhere with an interest in Amherst can log in and listen to it, um, as well as news organizations too. Um, so I think it will, it'll help us and other organizations expand our coverage for sure. And the second point to that is, I think a lot of people are taking note that, oh, I can have a news conference too. 
Um, you know, I don't need to be the county executive. I can just have a news conference and send everybody a URL. Um, and, you know, three or four or a dozen reporters will show up and cover it. Um, you're going to see a lot more people, I think, have those types of events that maybe were shy about it or didn't have them before um, because they just have, have seen it all uh, in action. Um, the mayor of Buffalo today is actually announcing an, in, an, an initiative about the carbon footprint for the city of Buffalo post NY pause. Um, and he's talking about changing the way the city does business, who does business and where they do it. Um, I don't think all those employees are going back into City Hall. I'm not saying they're getting laid off, but they have discovered that there are certain aspects of the way the city does business that can be done as well, maybe better, but certainly as well um, at home. And we're going to see some enormous changes. Look for your, your Intercom Buffalo, uh, you know, obviously you're there and some of the, some of the journalists are there or whatever. There's no salespeople. You have a whole sales staff. Right. They're all working from home. Now, unfortunately for your business, you know, there are a lot of advertising revenue is down. A lot of people, businesses are closed. So they don't have the cash flow to advertise, although I think they should advertise uh, if they have the cash flow. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, when things quote unquote get back to normal, I don't know. Do, do we have to have sales staffs in a building all the time? Or I think there are, yeah, there are a lot of cubicle farms. I think they're going to be out at the dumpster pretty soon um, because, yeah, I think, uh, you know, our staff is, is learning certainly to work remotely, um, you know, whether it's the sales staff, um, you know, and, and you mentioned I'm, I'm one of very few people that are in this building. We split up um, the morning anchor team. One person is home. One person is here. Um, uh, two of the talk show hosts are working remotely. Uh, David Bellavia, uh, Sandy Beach, they're not in the building. Um, we have two reporters working remotely. We never see them. Uh, we don't let them come in here. Um, and part of that is, yeah, because we can. The other part is safety, um, to make sure that we have a, a separation in staff that, you know, if there were infections, et cetera, that we would always have healthy people. Um, and thankfully, that has not been the case. But um, I think for sure in our industry and, and in many industries, you're gonna see, um, especially the, the cubicle farm type thing, um, go out the window, uh, it literally, to, you know, to the dumpster, because I think so many things can be taken care of and done from home and probably save your employers a whole bunch of time and grief and money if you have to. Yeah, One, for, for sure, when I, you know, if you can turn a negative into a positive, for me, I'm learning so much the last five or six weeks. I've learned a lot more about technology. I don't know if I could have even done this with you five weeks ago. I know it's actually not that difficult, uh, but I didn't know. So I did a little homework. We, we figured it out. Uh, got myself a little, you like my mic? I do. That looks just like Larry King. Yeah. Well, I feel like Larry King. I just need the suspenders. Good thing you don't look like Larry King. He did have seven wives though, didn't he? I love Larry King's show. That was terrific. Yeah. I wonder how we, I have not heard from Larry King in, in quite a long time. He does paid infomercials now. Yeah, that's not for me. Anyway, hey, Tim, I, I know you're busy. I appreciate you. Tim Wenger, operations manager, news director, WBEN, uh, WGR, and ESPN 1520. Thanks for your time. Uh, stay safe. Uh, and, and good luck. Thanks for the advice for the kids, too. Hey, you as well. Happy to be here anytime. And uh, good luck to everybody out there. And uh, you stay safe, too, Steve. You can download all of our Sidewalk Talk podcasts on your podcast platform of choice. You can also watch any of our podcasts by visiting our website, shovelthesidewalk.com. And if you or someone you know has a story of inspiration, of information, education that needs to be shared, just fill out the simple form on the website and we'll have that person or we'll have you on as a guest on one of our upcoming episodes. Thanks again for participating, for watching, and for listening. I'm Steve Fortunato, and this has been Sidewalk Talk.